So, you know, it doesn't sleep all that. And then we're on the banks of the dog. All right, so uh, I feel a perfect person because I think it was two years ago we had some vinyl days out here. So vinyl or is it called digital? I don't even know this is like a game about sensibility. But, uh, do you think, um, what is the difference? Do you see the huge difference? Should it be brought back? And, who wants to carry those records? Well, that's the thing. Well, the thing with vinyl, too, is when you went to a gig, you didn't have 10,000 songs you took with you. You had to plan your night. You had to make sure you had the right records, a little bit of whatever. Because you could, you know, say, could carry 10,000 records for the day. Now, you just bring your little hard drive or USB stick or whatever, and you don't have to think quite as much. But starting in vinyl, though, you, I still have that mindset of, Got to plan your plan your night, you know, plan your day or whatever, and not just walk in there and ring it. Uh, you know. uh, but yeah, that's, you know, vinyl. Well, vinyl. They every year you get vinyls coming back, and I heard Sony just opened up a new record pressing pressing plant or something like that. So I don't think vinyl will ever totally go away, you know. But uh, but uh, MP3 is so much easier. So could uh, each of you just touch on that topic? Vinyl. Vinyl. I mean, we have a picture. Okay, let's see. We got pros and cons. Uh, you can't play in the sun. They warm. They're heavy. They take up a lot of room. Blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on. So everyone who, the DJs who started with vinyl here know what I'm talking about. Um, playing out of town, putting them on a plane, hoping they're at your destination when you're there. Big nightmare. Um, it's a whole bunch of disadvantages of vinyl. Um, I don't miss it. Uh, I, I, I prefer, I really miss using CDs. I do use thumb drives now because your library, you can have a larger library on thumb drives. Uh, I save all my music in a WAV format. I do all my editing in Sony SoundForge. Um, all of my songs are all normalized, they sound the same. Um, but as far as going back to the question, Bobby, what was the question again? The question is just your vinyl, digital, like, you know, what, what, what is the big thing? Did you see the, the idea of vinyl, you know, a couple of years ago, like I said, I have a picture of Max here, when we did the vinyl day. Um, but I haven't really seen anything since then on it, so it's sort of like, do you think it's, it was a passing fad? It's, yeah, well, I, I don't, I seriously don't think it'll be back or yeah. come back. Um, most, or 100% of all of the clubs now are either using uh, laptops or uh, CDJs um, to have turntables and to go back to that again. I don't think anybody wants to go back to that. Uh, buying vinyl, uh, carrying vinyl around, it's, it's a thing of the past. And we live in the present and the future, as far as I'm concerned. The past is the past. Yeah, I, mean, I would think it was sort of a marketing ploy to kind of get people to come back. Anybody else have any feelings for that? But it was the final question. Oh wait, I, I did have something to say for that. I'm not taking pictures on my 35 millimeter camera. I'm not using my landline. Move forward. Embrace the technology. Deal with it. That's the way it works. Don't be afraid to move forward. So many people are. Yes. I have really mixed feelings because I I DJ on everything from like the cassette tapes where you like rewind automatically, you know, and try and find the beginning to CDs and vinyl and everything. I miss the feel of vinyl. I miss DJing vinyl. I miss going to record stores and picking out vinyl. I miss like looking through my records and seeing something to pull. Um, it also depends on where you are. So what happened in New York with these smaller venues? They just got rid of the turntables. So you couldn't, even if you did play vinyl, you have to bring turn with it if you wanted to. So you kind of had this tradition over the CDs uh, and then to a lot of top threes. Um, however, in LA and London, places where there's more space, there's like a vinyl resurgence, you know? Like I went to Venice Beach and there's this beautiful vinyl store because people got these big houses that got really to have record players in them, you know? So you could actually have that. I think it's more of a niche thing now. Yes. But one thing, I don't like to obsess over too much because, you know, people, like some of the younger kids that come up, they kind of like, say, oh, vinyl's the best, and that are really snobby about it. I mean, if the, you think about when you guys are coming up, or Frankie Knuckles, like, you were using the technology at the time. You know, like, if Frankie and others had it, like, spliced together real-to-reels, 
and done new things with technology, you wouldn't have had the sort of remixes and things that happened. So I think you have to sort of balance it, but definitely embrace it as well. Yeah. Uh, one thing Kevin mentioned, and I want to I want to emphasize that the, the culture of uh, going to record stores and seeing your fellow DJs and talking to them and comparing notes and uh, that yeah, I think we all miss that. It was part of part of the scene, and it's it's over now, uh, and we all do it at home and on our computers. But uh, it was wonderful. Um, so going back to the main point, um, I do remember uh, on on 9/11, uh, I was flying to New York, and uh, it was the last time I actually flew with vinyl, and uh, after that, of course, the airlines made it impossible because of weight restrictions and whatnot, and um, uh, I certainly don't miss it. I never had any problems traveling with vinyl. Uh, the only time I actually ever um, had a problem was I was flying to Fire Island to, to uh, Iceland, and my records didn't make it. I had to use Billy Carroll's record collection, and I had absolutely no idea where anything was. It was a catastrophe, or as Donald Trump would say, a disaster. Uh, and um, so, you know, I was very lucky. No matter where I went, my records were in canvas bags. They were not protected. They never got damaged. I was really lucky. Um, but yes, it is It is a digital age now. And uh, uh, Ray Caviano posted an amazing article that, on Facebook uh, about uh, vinyl versus digital and stuff. And the, the thread was like hundreds of comments and people felt very strongly one way or the other. And it was very interesting to read. Uh, people are very opinionated on this subject. Uh, but I agree with one person that said, it's really all about what's coming out of the speakers and how you put it together. Uh, and what's going on, the chemistry between you and the dance floor. It doesn't really matter the media. Well, for me, uh, I was always an aggressive mixer, and you know, taking two copies of a record and remixing it. And it was just amazing that you could move this needle around so fast, and you could look down at, at the record that was playing, and you could see where the breaks were, and you you, you would. You could read what you were seeing, you know, just where the needle went down. So that was always fun to do with vinyl. And when I listen to my old tapes, I think to myself, how the hell did I do that? <laughs> you know, really, we weren't much younger and more nimble, but uh, the, the nice thing about digital media is that we can do a lot of tricks electronically. We can loop intros, we can, we can change things around, which is really nice. And you can have steady tempos on old songs that never had steady tempos. And that makes mixing a lot easier. Uh, my records went with me around the world a million times, everywhere. And I was I was fortunate that I only had trouble with once when I was playing my friend's wedding in Columbus, Ohio, and I got there on the record soon. But the wedding wasn't until the next day, so I, they came that the next morning. But, but I can remember the first time I flew to Tokyo to play there, I had six canvas bags that I brought with me, and they weren't in luggage. And I remember convincing people online to carry them for me. <laughs> I, really, I was trying to carry all six. And I was on the top floor of the 747, and I had them all with me, believe it or not. And back, but back then, it was easy to leave things like that. And, uh, and I would still carry records. And um, you know, having been a veteran of over 70 gay cruises, I'd bring my vinyl on the cruises, as you did. And then at one point, the owner of the, the owner of Atlanta said, okay, no more vinyl, you have to switch over. And I remember just, oh my God, I don't have these records to flip in the booth because you became used to what color something was in a 12 inch jacket and I had everything labeled and it was in speed order. And you remember it was just by tacti tactility where things were. And then all of a sudden you had to start reading things in a book. And that was, that was the biggest challenge for me, I think, of the switch. But honestly, it's like what Robbie says, you know, what, it's the music that's coming out of the speakers that's important. And going back to what Steven said, you're only as good as the quality of a musical file. So many of these DJs that are playing, they have crappy musical files, and it sounds like a transistor radio playing loud on the speakers. So you want something that's a really, really good file with a high uh, uh, Bit rate, so it sounds closer to vinyl. It may not have the bottom end and the warmth that vinyl have, but it doesn't sound like you're in a tin can for eight hours. Okay. End of soapbox. 
The only thing I'll say is that I, I actually did start on vinyl, but as a complete college amateur 25 years ago, and I uh, came out the, at the radio station, and I love working with vinyl. And um, I love the sound of vinyl, and the feel of vinyl, but it was, I never thought it was something that I could actually do with my life, or make money. So I kind of left it for 15, 20 years or whatever. But the point is that, to answer the question, um, there is a resurgence, but it's a consumer resurgence. It's, it's a luxury niche. I mean, people, especially marketing to people of a certain age, I mean, I still buy a, a ton of vinyl records. I love going to all the used record stores in the city and scouring for hours and finding things either I don't have other than a master or that have a different cover. It's like I'm still a collector of art, so um, I feel as if that, that's not gonna help me here. Um, unless it's something I find that's just so amazing that I then digitize it, and then I can use it that way. So, that's it. Kind of the one that, of course. Okay. Um, also, one more thing. Also, what changed was that the promo stopped coming on vinyl. So, if you were going to play a new record from a label, um, you know, you get these white labels or promo copies ahead of time, they stop producing because they're just too expensive, so they started sending digital files or CDs. So, that also had a big uh, to shift as well. And um, I'd say one more thing also, but I definitely, I was starting off as a vinyl DJ also, but that being a DJ was a full-time job when we were doing vinyl, and I'm sure reel to reel because I, all day, every day, we'd like go to the record stores. Like you didn't have, it wasn't like a side thing you could do. You had to do that full time. You need to go get all the records. You need to go to labels, and it was like a lot of time. That's definitely one thing that's changed a lot in the DJ industry. Thank you. Uh, is there still a song of the summer? You know, every summer, um, you know, in the Fire Island history, for me, I can think of songs that remind me of different summers. One being, uh, I don't even know who the artist was, it was a remake of El the Elton John song, Your Song. I think you were the DJ then, and everybody here would sing along with it. And it was just a great moment here. It, I, I'm not really sure, but it was a, one of those, yeah, and it was a dance, but it was a dance version of it. Yeah, and people, yes, yes. And yeah, that was me. That was the Elton John Almighty mix. Yes, mix. And I would, I would lower the music and let them sing. Yeah, yeah it was strategically. It was, it was just a great, beautiful, one of those beautiful moments I remember here for me. But that was like, for me, the song of that summer. So do you still think this goes on? Do you still think there is a song every summer that you can think back to say, yeah, I remember last summer, when was last summer? Absolutely. It's just become so aggressive. So people know in March are like, this is going to be the song of the summer. I know it. And it's always like, girl, maybe it hasn't been released yet. Let's wait and see. Because you can't make it happen. It kind of happens to respond to it. But I think what's interesting about this particular issue is that I find that there are always two songs of the summer because there's always a straight song of the summer and a high song of the summer. So I feel as if like, they, they sell them, they sell them, you know, match. So if I had to say something right now, I would say that clearly in the straight world it's Despacito, which I never want to hear again. But I'd say that, you know, right now that Oliver Jackson song, which is not really getting as much, um, you know, popular support, I mean, the, everyone here, like, you put it on and they start screaming and, and jumping for it. So will it be the song? I don't know, but I find there's definitely a divide. Uh, um, there is definitely a song of the summer. I don't really know what it is this year myself, but uh, I can remember, uh, for instance, Happiness by Alexis Jordan when she was performing at the Pines Party. And uh, I was fortunate enough, I, I called up the promoter uh, and I said, Can you give me the acapella tracks? And I got them. And so I had the acapella version of it, which was, you know, after she had performed it that night, I got to play the acapella and, you know, when I closed the party late. But that was, you know, that was the Pines song of the summer, for sure. But yeah, we always have one out here. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, there is a song every summer. And when you think back, uh, you hear something, someone pulls out an old and it's like, oh my god, yeah, that's, you know, and it takes you right back to that place. And that's really the wonderful thing about music, because it really can time travel you to a different place in time. I don't know, I'm like him, I don't really, I wish I was out here more often, I could tell you what it is, but you know, coming here just briefly, I can't, can't tell you what it is, but I'm sure the locals all know what it is, or they'll, they will by Labor Day. Make music! For sure. For sure. Make music by Ari Gold. <laughs> Hi, Ari. <laughs>
Um, yeah, I think the first year I was out here, I can't remember, it was, the song was either David Guetta and Callie Rowland. Yeah, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, Six Over. I think that was the first one. And I did that in a, a Moto Blanco, uh, Mary J. Blige. Those are like kind of the big, of that era of the Pines, that was kind of, those were kind of the songs that song I did at that point. This summer, I think it depends on the age group. Um, I think the, the young kids really love the Katy Perry Swish Swish. It's the whole RuPaul's Drag Race runaway kind of kind of thing happening. But yeah. I'd like to say that there's a song that's summer every summer, but it just has to happen. You can't make it happen, as Michael said. Like you can't force it. It's just got to happen. I think Alexis Jordan Happiness was like I remember everywhere I went, every house was playing that song, just walking by. That was just like really crazy, but that song is really pretty. What do you want? I, I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, chatter from the uh, peanut gallery often, like, oh, this, you know, when, when Katy Perry did her swish swish on SNL, like, everyone was loving it. I was like, oh my god, my entire Facebook feed, Facebook feed was so happy about this. And then everyone was like, oh my god, everyone on my Facebook hated it. I'm like, mm -hmm. so you, just, you hear a lot of that. Just, yeah, there's always a song yeah. in the summer. I agree with Michael Despacito in the straight world, and some in the gay world, although I don't want to hear anymore either. And uh, Swish Wish actually would be my guess so far, but that could change in any minute, you know. But yes, it's always a summer song. Okay, I have to agree that um, th th there's a lot of great music out there, and I'm not going to just say that there's a song for the summer, there's a song for everybody, actually. Um, but my all-time favorite from my signature song is Lighthouse Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, songs like that, and uh, as Max said before, The Boss, I, I, it's year after year goes by, and that song can come on and the crowds come out. So it brings me to my next question. Why do you think this generation responds to classic disco? Some of them weren't even born when this music came out. So when I see that, I'm always like, you know, people, that's because I love it so much, but when people say to me, oh, well, no, that's old music, I'm like, there's two 23 years old kids dancing to that song that they weren't even born to. So, why, why do you think this generation responds to that? I think a lot of it has to do with the energy that it creates, and they see it around them. And it's all about energy. It's about energy, being happy, uh, words, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, I, I'm just going to touch on that because I wrote this post the other day about disco and what it meant to me. Uh, and maybe I'm old school, maybe I am uh, old, but there was horns, there were strings, there were words, and they were beautiful. And I think it gave people this you know, sense of uh, closeness and intimacy. And as I said on this post, in these troubled times, that's why I think people respond to this kind of music now. It's happy music. Uh, people want to be happy. Um, it just puts a smile on your face. You, I watch it here when we do these tea dances like we will do tonight. And I watch the faces of people. And last week I was up at Vito's, haven't been there in a while, and I'm always amazed at all of them and watching how people respond to the music. So, yes. No, it's true. The, the, the younger people get caught up in the energy of the music that the, the older people listen to and it becomes one big party. But the one thing I do have a problem with earlier in my house, one of the guys, uh, the other guys that was there, said, oh, I heard a really cool remix of Donna Summer, The Boss, last night. It went on forever, this and the other. And my roommates had to hold me back because I wanted to check them at that point. I just wish they would get the, the learn the names of the songs a little bit more. But yeah, it's the energy, it really is. Uh, actually, I love that's a great question, and I feel very strongly about this. But I, I think we're in an age where um, media divides us as opposed to unites us. I mean, when I was growing up, we had five channels and four channels and you watch these things now there's so many things to watch and there's so many DJs to listen to and so many songs to consume and people are divided even if they like a song like there's this remix and this remix and it's like there's not five remixes there's not three remixes it's just like there's a hundred remixes and everyone's gonna have their own thing and 
it's harder to unite people with music. And I think people are like, they're yearning for that sense of unitedness that like, this go really brought around in dance music. That was the first dance music culture, like in like, so people like yearning to get together and feel that sense of unity and as opposed to being divided by their media. Yeah, I just on a side note again, you know, because uh, we have a connection on the internet with, with our site, I always see the response to 70s pictures with kids. Like if there was a time tunnel, they'd all be diving into it because it was a golden age here. It was this beautiful place with beautiful people. And when these kids see these Polaroids, Tom Bianchi, uh, pictures, I, I can't imagine, you know, the response I see just from a photo is amazing. So, uh, you know, to talk about the music, you're absolutely right, it's the same thing, they embrace that. Well, that, that travels over to photography, too, like, because, you know, you had, you had one photographer here, now everyone has a camera on them at all times, and there's, like, streams and streams of images to look at, and people, it's harder for people to focus on one thing and for something to gain momentum at a time. Yeah, I think I think the reason that young kids like disco is that well, for a few reasons. I think it's fresh sounding to them. Um, there's been a trend in the past five years or so of a nostalgia to the '70s, you know, especially in the gay world with mustaches coming back and you know the dress. And so I think kind of there's a cyclical like trend, you know, it's kind of the right time for '70s and then '90s as well. Um, and so, and I think guys like Horse Move Disco in London when they had the Sunday party that became really huge and trendy. They come here, kind of all the Brooklyn crowd sort of um, just loves disco. And I've actually been playing it at Troll T a lot this summer, and you're right, the young kids, they know it. They, they really love it. And actually, well, I did a pride float, and I specifically had like 20, 30 year olds say, no matter what you play, play disco. I want to hear disco today. Yeah, uh, again, another side note is... Stop uh, interrupting. I'm sorry, I just... I mean, you're making it so interactive, I can't help myself, but... Um, just talking about the, the era, 70s, the retro, the, the kids liking that. Um, if anybody has ever seen my throwback pictures, I had a beard all through my, my 20s and 30s. I look like the kids now, and everybody wants to meet that person. So, sorry, but you can't turn back time. But you can. I mean, you really can. I mean, that's, that's a great entree. I mean, you really can uh, musically, but I know you can't bring that person forth. But uh, I mean, that's what that's what music does, and, and what a perfect time to bring it up because of this question. I mean, music can you can go back, and and you know, ushering out all these uh, is like a great facilitator. Uh, a couple of points, um, briefly. It's very easy for any DJ, you know, worth of salt to you can fool a young person by playing something that they've never heard before and make them think it's brand new because um, you know we have such a library tucked away in our heads of, of classic music and uh, that's not played in regular rotation not like the boss or not like donna summer but um and there's some wonderful music that, that really is relevant and really can work in today's musical programs formats um uh also um she was where can i go with this but uh no, I guess that's good enough. Yeah, on everything. Well, the nice thing about disco is um, it's been popularized in movies, like Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and that, and that did a lot for disco. Because people would watch that movie, and drag queens did a lot of uh, drag to those songs, and, and people get that feel-good aspect from disco. And like what you were saying, music is the great equalizer, really. Across the board, totally. And people can sing along to those songs because they've heard them on the radio. You know, they, and the younger kids, they heard their mom and dad playing it, perhaps. I, I mean, I've had people come to me, oh, my mom used to play that song all the time. You know, here I was, a 40 year old, playing it. Oh, okay. But, you, know, that's, you know, that's where they grew up in songs like that. So they will sing along. And when you have these disco parties, you can look out on the crowd and everybody's singing along. But not staying away from that because when you have, uh, I'm always amazed because I'm not really up on the, the pop music of, of right now, not so much, and I see people singing along to every word on pop songs too, so people do like to sing along. So, I mean, that's just in there, in them. Yeah, they were.
Well, we're going to talk about something a little bit more Ireland Pines related. How do you think the migration, and I just call it the migration because it is here from low T to twirl T to fun T, has changed? Uh, um, we were talking before about the old pavilion and the, you know, I remember the garage doors open. I remember the, the dancing and the crazy stuff that went on up there. Um, high tea, you know, what happened? How did that all, you know, between our fires and, you know, where we had to change our migration to the pool area. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, for those of you who are, who are out here regularly, uh, about how that migration, how it might have changed, all of that. So, well, I think you just hit on it. I mean, literally, the physical landscape has changed. When I first started coming out just to dance, I mean, we would go to all three. We'd start at low, and then we'd go to high, and we'd do that every single day. Um, and now, I, I, I don't think there's a, a, a map that people always follow a certain way. Like, I, I don't have friends that are like, okay, well, I'm gonna come to you with OT, and then I'm gonna hit this and then hit that. It's more just like, I feel like it's more haphazard. What are they feeling? What's the house doing? What are they doing at, you know, in the afternoon? So I kind of miss that journey because I used to love taking it and I knew exactly like, oh, oh, it's this time. I can't miss this song that Beatles will be playing at by a certain hour, you know? So it's, uh, but I think a lot of it is because of the physical change of it and also I mean, the properties being united. You know, we have so many options. We have so many fantastic options that we were able to kind of take advantage of. It is. We literally have the smorgasbord um, DJs, dance music, and clubs to walk. That's true. Like back back in the days before cell phones, you know, people would actually look on the boards to see who was DJing, and that was before the internet even. So when you came out here, you'd say, "Oh, well, Robbie Lewis is playing tonight. Warren Gloves is playing to dance," and. People would literally find out who's playing and they would go home to their houses and say, we have to go to T-Dance, or we're not going to T-Dance. It depended who, you know, you know how they were here. And, uh, right, right. and of course, that was before you had a lot of choices. I mean, like you said, they would come to low T and then go to middle T and then to, uh, I mean, low T and then high T. It wasn't a middle T, and then they would go to the pavilion. And, uh, when Bob Howard was managing the pavilion, we would actually open up the pavilion on Saturdays early for dancing. So we had the pavilion open from six to midnight as well. So we would have, the place would be packed, and we would just switch over the DJ at midnight to the nighttime DJ. But, but there, was, there was less competition and things happening in, in those years. And the most important thing, I know I said it, the most important thing is the cell phone. Because when you look out on the dance floor here and you just see people on their phones. We're going to get to that. Oh, are we? Well, uh, yeah. All right, well, then we can wait, right? We just tried to pour, you know. Yeah. Uh, no. All right, you're next. Uh, the one thing's for sure, you can't, you can't force it. Uh, and by that I mean, um, you know, you can make it very easy. Okay, this is the place to be at such and such a time, and then you really should go here. Uh, and it's great for club owners and management to, to design these elaborate schedules. But really, at the end of the day, it's the people that decide where they want to go and what they want to do and how they want to structure their, their afternoons and evenings. Um, and that's not unique to Fire Island. I think that happens in different cities. Uh, some places, I mean, people will spend a fortune on a magnificent club and it just, it's a fail. It just doesn't work, it doesn't click. And, uh, and then something else, it just has this organic draw or there's just something about it where it's fun and people will just naturally cleave to it. Uh, and the same thing is here. I mean, we've tried things that haven't worked. Uh, and we, could, you know, I mean, my, I take my hat off to the owners over the years that have run these, these wonderful places uh, because they adapt season to season. They change things up a little bit. But uh, really, I mean, it, it's, it's, an, it's an evolution. It changes. It, it's very alive and it's not static. So it's, um, it's something that it's kind of fun in the way, the way it plays out. I think something I noticed is that in the late 90s, um, it was more about, at least for my group, maybe it was just like, it might be my two my people that I hung out with, but it was more about going to sip and twirl and then Pavilion. That was kind of the thing. And tea was kind of like hit or miss. But then, like, I feel like in the 2000s, tea kind of had a resurgence and it became like the, the main thing to do, and Pavilion was less so. Um, so people would get go to tea, they'd go to like Lean Tea, Sip and Twirl, or, or, or Vito and Middle Tea and Do Low. Um, I think there's still a structure that people do kind of tend to go out then and then have the dinners late at 10, but 
It's definitely, they're definitely more racist than they used to be. What these guys said. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it still just kind of happens. Uh, now, downtown here, between 6 and 10 p.m., basically it seems like everybody's out running around, whether you're at high tea, middle tea, front tea, low tea, whatever. Uh, whereas back in the day, it was more structured, and people were dressed for each tea and everything like that. I just wish they would come to low tea at 4 o'clock and not 6.30, 7 o'clock. That's it. Yes, yeah. yes, and yes. Oh, yes. Let's start at five. Yeah. Let's start even earlier. Anything you want to add to that, Steve? We're going to be wrapping up soon, but before I we wrap up in ten minutes, I just want to talk about the cell phone issue. Um, what I, you know, very quickly, let's go through this and talk about what do you see the future of that? Do you see where people would have to check cell phones? Um, I think even just for sociability, you know, people should check cell phones so that they can actually talk to people. I think people will have to pay to talk to people in the future. But club-wise, what are your feelings about that? I, I, I have no idea. I, I don't know where it's going. Um, but at any rate, going back to our conversation before is that um, it, is the, it is the present. And PJ created a playground for all of us, and I am very grateful for that. Awesome. Yes. Yes, I, I, I want to thank PJ on that note. Um, all of these incredible DJs are part of uh, the caliber of music, musicality here that we strive for, that he brings out here for everyone to enjoy. There is a, uh, a process, there is a plan for all of that. Uh, as we said before, we have an incredible history here, and that's because we've got top people creating that musical uh, landscape for all of us. So I want to thank every one of these DJs. You guys, incredible. Thanks for doing this. This is another one of my crazy ideas. Thank you, PJ, for listening to the idea. And thank you, everyone here, and let's party. 70s are going to be back today. Oh, yes, yeah,